for a long time. I was like, dang, I have to, as a black man with tattoos and locks, um, carry myself in a different way to seem more approachable. Conscious Crew, we are back for another episode of the Conscious Creative Corner, where we unpack our trauma to heal our relationships. Today on the corner, we have somebody special. We have Brandon. Brandon, what's up? Hey, hey, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for allowing me to be on your show, honestly. I yeah, of course. <laughs> so why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, my name is Brandon, and I work as a licensed behavior analyst. I created for the collective, which is a, a whole network of healing and of healing, personal development, and just financial empowerment. Um, what we are, what we do is collaborate with those subject matter experts, practitioners, and businesses who are aligned to kind of highlight all those people who are doing doing the thing to help people transform right now and go from survival mode to thriving mode. And we wanna try we wanna partner with them, create programs with them, courses with them, um, or even just simply just getting their awareness out to the community. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Okay, so do you like and your program intersects like you join the the client or the possible participant with like a program? Um, we, we, so as a behavior analyst, one of the things I specialize in is creating systems and programs to get people from here to here with data back strategies to curate how the behavior change and to change the environment at the same time. So that way it's a maintained, sustained change. Um, so I can, yes, come in and help by what I've done before, prior is creating a program with somebody to meet their target audience's problem, mm -hmm. where they are with her information, with a weight management clinic. I've helped her create a program to help people like with behavior modification and with just the nutritional information, like to tailor it to where they are, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also some of the things for the collective does is just, just events, have webinars and classes um, in order to get the information that we deem uh, in the realm of transformation 101 regularly available to people. So I have a podcast, we have a YouTube channel with, um, we are always doing events in person. Um, we love in-person energy, but sometimes everybody can't make that. So we try to do some things online as well. Oh, that's kind of dope. I don't think we have anything like that here in Connecticut, but so did you spearhead this Ooh. yourself? Say it again. Did you do this? Like, did you spearhead this yourself? Yeah, no. It's it's been something that was sitting on me for for years, um, and I I am now creating a foundation for it. So that way, I am very soon about to get a virtual assistant, so I can get some people to kind of just do some back end stuff, and mm -hmm. then I can spend more of my time working on the business. And creating new products, new strategies, creating offers, sending them to people. Um, so yeah, no, I, I've done, I've been doing it myself for most of the time up to this point, but I'm, I'm getting some help now. Reclaim your time, right? Like, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, you put, you, you set the foundation. So, you know, if you could have yeah. other hands help, you know, your, your mission is still going through. So, I like that. Um, yeah. VA save lives. So. Do do what you gotta do, okay? No, hundred percent. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you have the you have for the collective, um, but also you're here now. Just kind of be a little bit more transparent, right? Um, you're in the corner because, as you heard, my podcast is all about unpacking trauma to heal your relationships. I'm not saying that you have any unhealed unhealed relationships, but it's important for people to know that there's things that go on in life that we don't really address. And they do show up in like our everyday lives, like in our friendships, our familiar relationships, our romantic relationships. Yeah. So just to kind of get things started, I want you to think about young Brandon, right? Mm -hmm. And think about, how, do you mind me asking how old you are? 
Yeah, no, that's fine. I'm 29 years old now. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so think about young, definitely think about young Brandon <laughs> and um, the life that you went through. If you could give your younger yeah. self one piece of advice for navigating relationships and just healing from any past trauma, what would that be? <clears throat> oh, man. Um, I would say that given... You know, how, just everybody's different. Everybody has different experiences, his backgrounds, up, and understanding that those relationships that you had in college, high school, maybe even middle school or elementary school that maybe some people are like fond of remembering, um, that remembering that everybody has their own things, their own things that they go through, the way that they were raised, their experiences, and those things are not a reflection of you. Uh, because, you know, as a high schooler, you know, dealing with so much energy in high school, you kind of like just you're getting so much, especially when I was I was playing sports. I was it, I was definitely into honors classes, which helped a lot because I was surrounded by people who I saw work, working hard. Right. Um but I definitely know that as a high school, I was I was very easily influenced, you know? And I know the big part of that, in that stage, um, I would tell myself to, one, be careful and not, not um, think that everything everybody else is dealing with is a reflection of me. Um, and then, yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, hindsight, right? It's, it's, it's like, you know, you learn, you live, you kind of tell people, I mean, you tell yourself things that you wish you didn't know. So I think that's pretty, um, it's it's helpful for you. Did you, like, what were relationships like for you in high school or like just in general, like friendships too? So did you find it easy to yeah. make friends? To be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I can talk with a lot of people, but I was definitely introverted high school um and it was different than most of the people who i was on the football team with and the track team because i didn't have like a huge circle um i, I played football but i didn't necessarily like kind of like hang out with all of them all the time yeah. um and then I liked anime, but like the people who watched anime when I was in high school was running around with their hands behind their back and headbands on. And I'm like, what are y'all doing? You know? Yeah. Uh, so it was, I was, I kind of didn't have a big circle, but luckily, fortunately for me, I had three of my cousins go to the same high school as me. Oh, I'm jealous. So, <laughs> oh my God, that was so helpful, man, because I got to like still have, I had to have, got to have family around. Yeah. in different ways i was skipping sometimes class and going to their lunch and hanging out with them um were they older or younger one of them was older one of them was in my um in my range and one of them was a year younger okay okay cool 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 I'm, uh, I'm i'm jealous i definitely went to <laughs> So I have a sister, um, but she's 10 years younger than me. <laughs> so it was just me <laughs> going through high school. And then um, I, I, luckily I did go to the same high school I went to like from middle school, a part of, right? So when I came to Connecticut, I went to the same middle school and high school. And I mean, I, yeah, I can, I can relate, right? It's just like, I did, I talked to a lot of people, like everybody would know who I was, right? But when it comes down to like, you know, knowing who I was, nobody really knew who I was, right? It's just like, yeah. I'm very personable. It's just, you know, you got to keep your energy. Yeah, same. You know? yeah, same. So I didn't like, I don't know. It was only a couple of people that I really like hung with and talked to on a very serious level in high school. And I think the point out what you just said, <clears throat> you know, the middle school that I went to in eighth grade, because I didn't go to the same one, six and seven, mm -hmm. the, was not the zone one I was supposed to be going to, right? So when I went to my high school that was actually in my zone, everybody was coming from a different set of middle school. So all of the, everybody else was already friends, they already knew each other in ninth grade. Well, it was brand new for me. So freshman year was much different than senior year, of course, where I was 
like everybody knew me, but not everybody really knew me um, yeah. compared to freshman year. Brand new, spanking new, everybody. And that's it's kind of scary sometimes for people. I mean, I don't know for you, but sometimes just like, okay, well, everybody, everybody's gonna know who you are because oh, that's the new kid, you know, like, and then everybody's trying to fill you out, and that's a lot of energy getting thrown at you at once sometimes, right? And so yeah. sometimes people kind of just go inward and like, yeah, let me just fall back and see, you know, what's to come. So I can completely understand that when you're thinking about now attachment styles, because that's my jam, like. Trauma, attachment okay. styles, I'm the expert. <laughs> what do you know about attachment styles, if anything? Um, I think there's like three or four, if I'm correct. Um, I don't know them in depth. <laughs> I, I had to read about them when I was in school getting my undergrad. I got an undergrad in in psych. Yep. But then I kind of def I definitely went to the science side of psychology with behavior analysis. So I don't remember as much about that. Yeah, no. It's it's cool, right? Um so anybody that actually went through like college, like some kind of higher level of education, everybody learns about this, right? So when I say it yeah. to people, people are like, yeah, I think I know. It's just, it's tucked in your brain somewhere, right? Maybe you wasn't paying attention in class that day. Maybe you skipped the class that day. But it's like one of those <laughs> foundational things that people teach. Um, and so when, and maybe you've seen this because it's highly known. There is a woman I I cannot remember this woman's name, so please forgive me. But she did this test, right? Um, this study on parents and children. And if this, if you can remember, let me know, right? If this, if this is something you recall, she did this test with parents and children, and so she put children in a room. And when she put children in a room with their parents, she would then have the parents leave and see how the children react, right? And based on their reaction, that's how she started to develop these attachment styles. Right. And so what we noticed was those children who were securely attached when their parents re-entered the room, they would come and give them a hug. Right. And when they're gone, they would be OK. Those parent, those kids who were anxiously attached didn't do so well. Right. Their parents would leave and they would start to cry, thinking like the parents would never come back. Right. And so when their parents re-enter the room, you could see um, a certain level of vigor in them um, going back to the parent and like being like overly emotional. With the kids that were avoidantly attached, they could care less if their parents left or came back, right? So the parent would be into the room, the kid would just like keep on playing, like nothing ever happened, right? The importance in this is these attachment styles play out in our relationships. Our, again, when I say relationships, very broad, family, familial, oh, sorry, familial, platonic, and um, romantic. The reason why we want to understand who we are when it comes to our attachment styles is because it'll show us a place of um, lack. Like if I know I don't do so well when somebody is badgering me, I can understand that that probably happens because I don't want my independence to be taken away from me. And that's what we most likely see in like avoidant attachments, right? Where if you're in a relationship, you get into an argument with your partner, your partner might be badgering you, you're like, chill, I need, I need a second, right? And um, your, up, your partner might not give you that second. The reason why you need that second is because your fear of independence is on the line. Where it's just like, if this person is always smothering me, they're engulfing me, I don't like it. And again, we can see that back at ch in childhood, where it's just like your parents didn't necessarily reinforce their ability to be around. I get it. We're all stressed. And sometimes we wonder if we have to even get up in the morning. Sometimes we wonder if that job is really worth it. The thing is, I understand these struggles because I hear these struggles with my clients every day. And I thought it would be a good idea to help build a community where we can feel less stress. So I created the Less Stress Community. If you want to join this community, you just text the word stress to 860-401-0207. In the community, you're going to receive three texts a week. Yes, three texts a week that is going to help elevate your understanding on trauma and how stress affects the body. I'm going to provide you personally 
prompts that are going to help you reflect. They're going to push you into a space of healing, whether you know that you've gone through trauma or not. You know, I did this because a lot of my clients struggle. And of course, you only see me once a week or maybe twice a month. But I knew it would be very helpful so for someone to be able to just use the text that they get to push them to, through some hard times. The best thing is it's only $17 a month and you can quit at any time. But trust me, you're not going to want to because there's some amazing individuals in the community that can help you. So not only do you receive text, but you're also going to be able to converse and exchange stories and share your prompts with other like-minded individuals who want to heal. So <laughs> I don't know what you're waiting for because I'm texting everybody right now. Make sure you hit the stress text community or less stress text community by typing stress in your phone to the number 860-401-0207 and I'll text y'all inside. All right. Again, with the, the, the anxious attachment, maybe you're the partner who's just like, we, we got an argument. We got to talk about this right now. We got to talk about this right now. And that's the fear that comes up because we're thinking, man, if I don't talk about this right now, my partner's going to leave me. It's a fear of rejection. It's a fear of abandonment. And you can see that again with that study. And then we have our dismissive. Sometimes people call it disorganized. There's so many terms. It's just the same thing, right? And with our disorganized, it could be a bit of both, right? But usually that happens with kids who have gone through like a series of trauma, right? Or having very, very, very inconsistent parents where maybe you have a problem and your parent might address it or you have a problem and your parent dismiss it and you're like, I never know who I'm going to get. Right. And so then that's how you become too. It's like, maybe sometimes your partner has a problem and you're like, Oh, let's talk about it. And the times you're like, I don't have time for it. You tracking what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as I say this, do you see yourself in any of these categories? Yeah, no, to be very honest with you, I think I definitely was taught with definitely my like parents and other situations to have like an anxious uh, attachment style. Because one of the things that I would do when, when it was, to be very honest with you, it has been a, a, a practice and work for a long time to like kind of just reshift that because I recognized it wasn't something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. but. Something was not going either my way or something wasn't, was getting like too demanding or too stressful. One of the things that I was like comfortable doing for a long time was just shutting down mm -hmm. or, or like, you know what? I don't have time for this. I'm going to like go do something else. Like take my mind off of it. Right. Um, so I, when you said the anxious uh, when I was like, oh man. <laughs> so yeah, that was definitely one that I think I had to, and I'm still working through it in different areas, but just getting more aware of it was was a huge, huge help because now it's kind of like you can kind of slowly make changes and, yeah. and see that, oh, see how that's doing this, or I, oh, I see like, I don't necessarily like the results of this this way. Um, mm -hmm. What you mentioned, right? Where you were like, hey, I would do something that would distract myself from it. There's a term for that. Yeah. It's called um, creature comforts, right? And so, like, yeah, creature comforts. And so, what that looks like is if you just broke up from a relationship or even as a child, you know, a parent or caregiver, because I don't want people to, it could be caregivers too, right? So, a caregiver didn't really meet your need. You learn how to self-soothe, but you develop something called creature comforts where it's like, maybe I'm going to go drink. Maybe I'm going to just go party. Maybe I'm going to go do something wild, right? And that's to take place of the security that you wanted to have or get, but could not get it. And when I say security, it doesn't necessarily always mean safety, right? Security also could mean, man, I don't feel secure to be emotionally vulnerable right now. So I'm going to do whatever I need to do to gain some sort of control. So I just wanted to kind of touch on that. So you said that you learned how to shift. At what point did you know, like, oh, this ain't it. I need to I need to shift into, like, something else. 
after um to be very upfront when I was in college I immediately after college I got out of a relationship and I realized immediately afterwards I was just like trying to just do a whole bunch of things right like I was trying to like immediately talk to other people or distract myself with partying and going out um going out and finding friends or just that was a big one especially kind of after school I was used to so much com- conversation and interaction but like coming home it was not as much right um and then to put on top of that I got out of a relationship similarly in that time frame after getting out of school um and then on top of that I was in my master's program so I was still I, was, I just started that but I was kind of like trying to do all of these different things and this was being affected it was like wait I can't do all these different things and do this what is this coming from um but prior to that very shortly after my first semester of my master's program i took some time and just had some like just a moment to like not i got out of group messages that i was in with a bunch of it was like a group message with a bunch of friends I, I, I cannot have this right now. I stopped talking to the to the person I was talking to at the moment and like dating at the moment. Um, I honestly like s- kind of stopped interacting as much just with the outside world for uh, like six months to a year. And I just worked with the school and studied like studying is a big hobby of mine just learning new things and stuff so one of those things that i took the time to like go into was myself at that time i was you know i was early 20s that time was transformational for me Mm. to have that alone and that stillness and see what i did like what i didn't what resonated what didn't my values were and then changing my life around those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sum up. It's, it's so, I mean, it takes a lot, right? In order for us to know that yeah. shift has to happen, we have to have a certain level of self-awareness, right? And understand like, okay, this is happening. This isn't working. Because some of us can go through life and just keep on, the like, keep going with like the foolishness, right? Where it's just like, oh, I'm in these group chats. I'm just staying in these group chats because of connection. Right, or false connection that we, we think. For you, you know, you said you just got out of a relationship. Um, I'm very nosy. So are you in a relationship now? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not in a relationship now. Are you looking? Um, I'm not necessarily. Well, I, I think about it. Think I about think it? about it, to be honest with you. Um, but when it's not that I'm not looking, I am not chasing it. Um, mm-hmm. And... I'm honestly like I have so much on my plate right now in terms of working on the 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 business mission, which is my mission in life, just exemplified within this entity. That is, I, I don't really have the time for a whole lot of foolishness, so I, I'm not entertaining a whole lot right now. But mm. yeah, so it sounds like you're scared. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I might... I mean, okay, so I'm I'm really big on words, right? Um, and sometimes we just use words nonsensically, right? So when you say I have my business, I'm working on my business, um, and you're not you're you're open to it, but you're not necessarily looking, but you also don't have time for the foolishness. The trigger word here is the foolishness. So do you feel like if you were to find a relationship or go into a relationship, your automatic guard would be, man, the first thing she do or they do, because I don't want to... Are you into women? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. It's 2024, so... All right. So the, so the first thing she does, yeah, I'm, I'm out. Like, do you feel like that's how you approach it? Um, It's something that I will say I have done that a lot in the past. Absolutely. Um, What I'm mean right now by that is not necessarily that I'm not open to it. Yeah. Um, 
but where I'm at right now, a lot of the times what I experience is, how can I say this nicely? Um, it, be transparent. It's fine. Say whatever you no, want. Okay. I know mentally I'm beyond most people my age. So mm-hmm. it, it's hard to date, to be honest. Because intellectually, it's hard that's what, what I'm talking it's hard to date sometimes because mm-hmm. I am, you know, I like, I like, you know, people look and people, how people look and is important, but like, that's just the sparkle of it, you know? So if like some, if I can't be intellectually stimulated, then it's going to not like. It's not going to work. No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Well, are you a sapiosexual? Because there are sapiosexuals out there too, you know? I, Probably, I think so. Um, so to tie that in, right? If if I'm not like intellectually stimulated in the relationship, and it's, or just in just how someone just be, right? Then what happens in my experience is then there's that disconnect is something that now is like, it's not a reciprocated amount of energy in terms of how we can connect. And it's just, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time there. That's fair, right? Because time is not one of those things you can get back. Like, you know, you can't go to the store and say, hey, can I get my time back? You know, so I, I respect that. When you think about your last relationship or just your past, can you see how any periods of trauma or like, um, and I want to break down trauma because people are just like, I've never been through trauma, but trauma is simply just something that you've gone through that shifts your like attention to something outside of your homeostatic baseline or simple words, like out of your normal. And it, it causes elevated series of stress episodes, right? So losing a... Losing a loved one can be considered something we call like a big T trauma. Um, maybe losing a job can also be considered a big T trauma or like a little T trauma. Little T traumas are just not as elevated in stress levels as big T traumas, but they're still traumas, right? Someone breaking up with like a girlfriend, boyfriend, or even a friend can be considered trauma because of what it does to our body. So if you're thinking about your life, Brandon, and things that have happened, do you see any periods in which, okay, maybe I've gone through high levels of stress and now it's impacting the way in which I'm seeing my relationships or interacting in my relationships? Mm. Yeah, no, I think one of the things that came up when you mentioned that, right, was so when <coughs> when I... I'm gonna tie this example in to give you like just the background. Yeah. Um, so when I'm at the grocery store and I'm in the granola aisle and I'm walking to the end of the aisle and somebody comes around that aisle and they look at me, they might immediately like, oh, just get startled for a second. And like I noticed that, you know, I'm not gonna say everybody doesn't, but because I noticed that. For a long time, I was like, dang, I have to, as a black man with tattoos and locks, um, carry myself in a different way to seem more approachable, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. To, to seem more approachable, to work harder, to get to work, because I'm told from the youth that you have to work double as hard, you know? So I'm, I have to not only seem more approachable because I'm startling I might startle that old white woman who comes around the corner, but it might not just be her. It might be that middle aged or old black woman or black man who does the same thing. Um, so that's that along with the outside world Mm -hmm. telling black men from teenager from honestly from the youth all through their life that you not only have to work double hard but look at your history you not you don't have you not blank you just 
all this degradation in music and um so that was one of the things that I definitely say has impacted not just my romantic relationships, but every relationship going forward with my college professors to peers to work and how you have to always kind of like think about how you're being perceived or how you're you're uh, exuding yourself, especially like in the workplace, you know. Uh, what if those were things that I had to definitely, oh, through time and through a lot of study, through some things, studying history and studying psychology, of course, um, and his story and, and things that, of course, in history that are like taken out or, or not it, spotlighted, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. Through a lot of time and research with that, it was like, okay, let me like learn these things so now I can get a better sense of my history. And now I can like take that and those two things and take myself outside of it and just look at it for what it is. Um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. No, it did. <laughs> it did. It did. I think it's important that you even no- make note of it, right? Um, because a lot of us. <laughs> I'm not a black man, but a lot of us in the black community, we understand how the perception of um, the black man, right? So I feel like people are going to hate me for this. Okay, so, (laughs) all right. So you as a black man, you're immediately on the opposite side of victimization, right? You are usually the perpetrator. You're seen as a perpetrator, right? And so like even in relationships or friendship relationships, let's say you're at you're getting into a fight, the police come on the scene, the first person they're looking at you is you. Whether it's like black woman, black man, black man, black you know, black white man. Yeah. Right. And so I can really yeah. understand. And the thing is, I don't know if you've ever had like um a specific trauma happened to you exactly but we know through history systemically things have happened right so we take that on and it's called vicarious trauma and now that's playing out that's playing out in our lives right where it's just like man their trauma now becomes my trauma and so now i'm hyper i'm hyper vigilant and that so like when you're in the grocery store what you what you mentioned was like hey someone startled not that you being very aware hyper vigilant of this other person's experience and the sad part is <laughs> what you said, which is sad in the sense of like, this shouldn't even have to be something we have to think about, but you're like, how can I make this person uh, see me as more approachable? Right. And of course we want to be approachable, but I'm hoping you're not changing who you are. Like how, how do you know? Okay. So what does that look like? That that was a um, good good question. That's something that I had to definitely like understand, like, Hey, this person, whatever you go and do that's not, that's not my problem. That's, or it's, that is their issue, insecurity problem. That's something that they have to deal with, not something that I'm I'm aware of it, and I might care, but like it's not my issue. But I wasn't always this way, so I was always, you know, being an empath as a teenager. I'm like, maybe I should like change a little bit of how I'm expressing myself, so that way I can seem more approachable, or more likable, or so I can make more friends because I know that on this side, like you said, I'm already kind of, and then I'm to myself, but I have like, I'm a, I'm a little unhinged. I'm really I'm going to do what I want, say what I want. So like, you know, like I, as a teenager, I'm like, I can't, I can't always be this way. You know, I got to like calm me down, you know? So that was something that I had to like definitely understand. Like, hey, that was. I would honestly definitely say that was a trauma response as it relates to how I should be perceived. Maybe because, like you said, in high school, like yeah, I got bullied a couple times, and in college, I I was I had friends, but I was always to myself, you know. Um, so trying to maybe make more friends in that space so that way I'm trying to like be more likable and stuff and more approachable, like you said. I think that was a good word for it. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. 
so you're an introvert, right? So sometimes introverts don't always be to themselves, right? So in college, even it sounds like to this day, you're probably a little bit more reserved with your energy. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What does that do for you? What does it do for me? Yeah. Um, one of the things it does for me now, per se, is it allows me to... So then I'll give you an example again. Um, I am, I am, I have a really big heart. I'm very, very loving. Mm-hmm. And I'm usually that person that, and somebody can just, I come into your space, we just have a conversation. You're like, damn, I feel like I can just be, I can just be me and just let loose. Mm-hmm. So I'm usually that person that's like helping other people with things, right? Which is okay, because that, I love to do that. I love to help people, but I do need to recharge. So being alone and having that silence and stillness is my recharge time, right? One. Mm-hmm. But the other thing it does is because of that fact I told you earlier, um, some people, whether it's friends, family, people you just meet, come in contact with energy that is like, damn, this is such high level loving energy mm-hmm. that I may or may not have experienced before in my life. Let me grab onto it. Mm-hmm. Let me attach to it. And mm-hmm. That's something that I used to allow because of my heart and, you know, just caring so much and whatnot. But mm-hmm. one of the big reasons why I definitely now as a 29 year old spend a lot of time to myself as an introvert is because of that fact too, because people will try to like cling on to the light, if you will. And um, I have to fill my own cup up so that way I can give based off of the overflow and not be drained because I'm giving somebody everything that's inside of it. If that makes sense. Mm, no, it does. It does. Me, if you will. Say that last part again. No, that helps me kind of like recharge and be protective of my energy. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I love saying this, right? So energy is important, right? But a lot of us, we're so free with giving away our energy. And I like to tell people when you're giving energy away, imagine being naked, right? You don't just get naked. It's 2024. I'm hoping y'all don't just get naked for everybody. (laughs) And so you want to make sure you're guarded with that too. Because you're right. A lot of people will come, especially if you have like a good spirit, right? And you're always like, you have good energy. People are going to want, they want to be a part of it. So I get it. You're alone. You take that time alone to recharge so that you can kind of give back. Right. And I like what you said about the whole overflow piece. That's kind of dope. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Put that in your bag. I will. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So you're you're now at this part. Like you're at in your life, you're a part of your geez, you're in this healing journey, right? Where you know who you are, you like you said, you can be unhinged at sometimes, but you are you show up authentically. (laughs) I don't know why. (laughs) It's okay, you're human, right? (laughs) But you're human. How do you think? So let's say somebody comes up to you like Brandon. You know, I really need some help, and they've gone through the same struggles you've gone through. What are some things that you would say to them to kind of overcome some of their past traumas or their inner demons? Just when it comes mm-hmm. to like healing and relationships. Mm, that's a good question. Um, it would honestly, it would depend on where they're at because one of the greatest skill sets that I know about myself is able to meet people where they are, individualized to where the space they are in, um, by you know being super observant and taking in. I'm a I'm a scientist, um, taking in all the data. But based on where they're at, what I would my main approach is I like to give examples and then break down that example toward how that can be applied from my life in this example and then we can kind of generalize this how this possibly can be applied to you and then from here from here now i gave you an a, 
a definition, an example of how it can, I've used it. And now we can kind of like use our creative juices to like, hey, what do you think about this option? Or I can kind of back mirror with them um, some of the options that was talked about in the example. And I was not as difficult as we might think all the time, um, kind of like be a catalyst. Mm. I like that. Do you do you find that people come to you for like advice or just like general? <laughs> all, all the time. <laughs> How do you handle that? All the time. Like, do you always like make space for them, or are you upfront when you really don't have the space or time to generally meet them, to connect with them, to help? Them? <laughs> well, I mean, it depends. It depends. Like, so not only like with friends and family, like of course with work, then I'm I'm. I have time that I'm available for work, right? Like, um, because of work, I'm always putting out fires and figuring out what solutions can be given to help the problem. Yeah. Um, so after a certain time of the day, six, seven o'clock, my phone is doing it, do not disturb. I done probably left it upstairs or on the couch somewhere. I forgot it. Like, where's my phone while I'm mm-hmm. cooking? Um, so I, I have a strict deadline for work related things, right? whether that's, that's doesn't get dealt with beyond this before this point in the morning and after this point in the evening. Um, and then as it relates to just people or just as you with friends, like I'm going to be very honest with you. I am very direct with my close friends. I have to tell them like, look, I love you, bro. But before you come in this house, I need you to like assess my energy and see like, hey, is he in a space to just for me to just vent? Because I might be, or I might not be, or you can just ask me if you don't know. Sometimes a friend of mine is just, are you in a space to for me to like talk right now? I'm like, yeah, what's up? What's going on? Yeah. And sometimes like, and I, not right now. Give me like five minutes, or like I can't right now. I'm sorry. I got I got some other things I have to deal with. Right you know, yeah. and which is cool, but if that happens, then I'm probably, because I know he reached out, like, oh, let me, let me reach out tomorrow. Let me reach out a couple of days from now. So I'll make the space, but it might not be in that time if I can't do it. Um, because, but to, that is, like I said before, I'm definitely um, in a space of continuously just work in progress, right? So that it wasn't always that way. One of the things that I'm doing now to as to talk about me protecting my energy and not being accessible all the time, right? Um, that came from learning the lesson of I can't be available all the time to everybody just because they texted me, I have to answer right now, or just because they called me, I have to pick up right at this second. Um, just because they're going through this thing, I have to go through it with them. Like, mm-hmm. it's not my thing. I can help them. I can provide some assistance, maybe some tips or some guidance. But having that big heart when I was younger, I was always trying to, like, go through everything with everybody, you know. Um, and still, sometimes as an adult, I find myself like, going back into there, like, hold up, wait, wait, that's not my thing. Let me, like, mm-hmm. let them to do the thing. You know, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question too. It does. It just sounds like you have boundaries. And I think it's the courtesy when, I mean, not everybody knows to do this, but hey, do you have time for me? I have one friend and she knows, she knows that she'll text me before she, she trauma though. She'd be like, Hey, you got, you got time to listen? <laughs> like, go ahead. <laughs> Other people, I might just leave you on red. Like, and it's not yeah. because I don't have, it's not that I'm not emotionally available. No, sorry. It is because I'm not emotionally available. It's not that I don't care, right? And we have to be also aware of our limits, right? Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's good yeah. that you know that about yourself. All right. I think this yeah. is pretty good. So we're at the portion. Progress. You said progress? Yeah, no, it's been a work in progress. It's not always been that way, you know? 29 years of practicing, right? Practicing. 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 You turning 30 this year? No, I just turned 29 April, last April. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. 
All right, so now we're in the portion where I just want to test your general knowledge on trauma. If you don't get it right, that's okay, but it's just kind of fun to know because when we quiz ourselves, it's actually a better way for us to consume and digest information versus just reading because you're doing something with the information, but I'm sure you know that. So, all right. First question I have for you is true or false, okay? <clears throat> According to a study by the American Psychological Association, nearly 70% of adults in the United States have experienced at least one traumatic event in their lifetime. True. Mm. I'll say true. That is true. It is yeah. true, right? Um, actually, to expound on that, right, the trauma is actually more common with relationship as well. So relationship trauma being one of the most common types of traumas that someone experiences. Yeah. Wow. I'm not surprised at that part because... Sometimes humans can suck. (laughs) We can. Sometimes we can. Okay. True or false? Okay. Research suggests that individuals who have experienced trauma in childhood are more likely to have insecure attachment styles in adult romantic relationships compared to those who have not experienced trauma. I would say that's true as well. Why do you think that? Um... Because I'm assuming that if they've had a, a significant amount of trauma in that childhood, and let's assume that the parents didn't know or didn't know how to deal with it with or for or help that child, you know, then that was something that kind of is due to manifest some way, right? So, like, it's going to manifest whether it's their own habits, own relationship styles. Um, so I'm assuming an assumption that they would have some patterns in that category. 100%. It's kind of like what we talked about a little bit earlier, right? Where um, you, ha- you have the disorganized or, um, yeah, I call it disorganized. I forget the other term people use. Um, attachment where you have the traumatic childhood, Right. And so then in your adult relationship, you are now mimicking what played out in your childhood, right? Because your partner becomes your parent in a sense. So very true. All right. True or false. Mm. Studies have shown that trauma survivors are at a higher risk of developing post-traumatic stress disorder, which can significantly impact their ability to form and maintain healthy relationships. Mm, So that's true as well. It is. Okay. You, you're real is. good at this. Maybe you know you, you know uh, a lot about trauma. There you go. And attachment styles. Right. I like, so I really like the subconscious. So that it kind of like the subconscious mind is, you know, which is 70% of the iceberg that makes up the mind, which mm-hmm. 30% is the conscious, right? The subconscious mind is influenced m- most easily by three things. And it's repetition, um, symbol, symbolism, repetition. So if you could tie those two together, that's but symbolism, repetition, and trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, those things are kind of what makes up the rest of the iceberg or influences it the most easily. Influence one hundred percent. Yeah. Look at you. Use it. I mean, you went to the science. Yeah, look at you. Okay. Uh, Two more, okay? True or false? According to the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, approximately one in four women and one in nine men experience severe intimate partner violence, intimate partner contact sexual violence, and or intimate partner stalking with impacts such as injury, fearfulness, post-traumatic stress disorder, use of victim services, contracting of sexually transmitted diseases. That's a lot. So just get it That is a lot. Four? One in four women, one in nine men. I'm going to say that's true too. It is. It's, you know, I love that we have the statistic for men because for some reason people think men are immune to intimate partner violence and 
It happens a lot. Yeah. It's just men don't report it. Right, so, right. Last one. You on a roll. You're going to have five for five if you get this right. Research okay. has shown that trauma can alter brain chemistry and neural pathways affecting areas of the brain responsible for processing emotions and forming attachments, which can contribute to difficulties in relationships. Mm, I'll say true as well. Mm -hmm. I preach. Go ahead. No, no, no. No, yeah, so it is true. Um, I preach a lot to people and I tell people that trauma is not just something that occurs. It alters our, our, our makeup. Right in our in our body, there's this book. Have you ever heard a book called "The Body Keeps the Score"? Mm-hmm. Have you read it? Um, I've listened to some of it. I haven't finished it. I've listened to some of the audio book, Audible, and it is an amazing read. Everybody should definitely go read that book. I tell everybody yeah. if I get everybody a gift, it would be that book. <laughs> I based mm-hmm. a, like my whole entire like structure and therapy because I deal with trauma is understanding how the body affects, I'm sorry, how trauma affects the body. And it makes up a lot of um, our reactions in our brain because of the chemical imbalances that happen once trauma occurs. Yeah. Us. Um, so yeah, you got five for five. You did good. <laughs> <laughs> you did good. Oh, yeah. All right. So that, it wouldn't be the conscious creative corner if I didn't do my fun segment. Unfortunately, Brennan, I have retired my this or that segment because I am 100% into my culture. And for the longest time, which is I'm being transparent with everyone, I used to hide it because of um, my parents <laughs> and just the okay. story of immigrants, right? Um, so now I make it my duty to make sure that everybody understands my culture and where I come from. Yeah. Are you um like African American or do you have any other um so my mom has a a few different things mixed up in her. Um when I did a genealogy test, she has some Irish, black, cool. and some native in her. Um which this is another story. <laughs> okay. I mean <laughs> come back and tell us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in or on this segment for the culture, what happens is I give you a list of words and I'm going to say them in Patois and you tell me what you think the meaning of it is. Okay, are you familiar with Patois at all? Mm-mm, what's that? No, it's, um, it's a dialect we use in Jamaica. Maryland don't got no no Jamaican people over there. <laughs> well, they got a little bit. Of, like, it's, it's, a, it's a big pocket of... Uh, like Indians, a big pocket of Mexicans, oh, Hispanic. Okay. Um, we got a big pocket of Ethiopians too. Yeah. Everybody always asks me, "Am I Ethiopian?" Um, yeah, like, nah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, ever since high school and college, everybody's asking me. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I mean, let's pocket. try. Okay. All right. So the first word is Irie. Do you know what that means? I can it's use like, it in a sentence. Yeah, can you use it in a sentence? All right. Everything Irie. Everything all right? Yeah, okay. It, it means like good, excellent, good, feeling good. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to have to use, okay, nyam, but let me put it in this. Or do you know what nyam means? Mm-mm. Okay. Let me put it in a sentence. Um... This is gonna be so obvious. Okay, um, me love nyam bread. Like eat. Yep. So if eat. I say, I uh, feel nyam, me love nyam bread. Like eat, eat. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Mash up. Is it like mix up? Mm mm. Um, like let me use one, it in a sentence. No. Okay. Um, then mash up the please. Oh wait, but maybe you don't. Do you know what I just said though? <laughs> the mash up the peas. Okay. No, just <laughs> mash up means. 
<laughs> Masha means to destroy, <laughs> like to break something. Uh, okay. 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 You've heard me say this one before. <laughs> Why go on? <laughs> yeah, I've heard that uh, in the podcast community. Yeah. Um, it was just like, hi, hello. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, what's going yeah. on? How are you? All right. Okay. Um, two more. Medea. Is it like midday? Mm-mm. Or so, Medea is a sentence. So I don't even know how to use it. <laughs> but it just means like, I'm here. I'm present. So if I were to break it down, me, like I'm, de, ya, ya is here, de is just uh, a proposition. You learn. So I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, no. I'm here. Okay. And then one more is Lickamore. Lickamore. Um, can you use in a sense? Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of this show, I'm going to say a little more. Like goodbye, good afternoon, mm-hmm. or I'll see you guys later? Yeah, see you later, a little more. Okay. So when you talk to your friends, just start saying a little more. <laughs> Don't do that. They're going to be so confused, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So this is cool. um, I'm going to challenge you. Okay. Yes. I was going to say, try to use one of these this week. <laughs> we got to bring some culture you- to Maryland. I got you. I'm gonna use it next time. I, uh, next time I'm in a group of people. Yeah. Damn. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. So this was this was fun. I think I learned a lot about you. I feel like the audience learned a lot about you. Hopefully, you learned a lot about Young Brandon and yourself and how you can move forward. Because it sounds like you're on a wonderful journey right now. Anyway, right? Just kind of healing yourself. <laughs> learning how to interact um, with other people in your relationships based on like things that you had already know prior to this conversation, but just your attachment style and like how you can improve <clears throat> because we can always yeah. improve. Right. Um, was there anything that stood out for you that you think you're going to reflect on after we finish this episode? Um, Well, you brought up a lot about about trauma that so all those questions stood out for sure like st- st- statistics and data like I, I love I like the data so to learn that it was like wow one in four or 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 it says seventy percent which is a high number but I would probably inflate that because a lot of people don't go to therapy or a lot of people don't reach out to therapists or even tell about or aren't aware of Mm -hmm. the habitual things that are guiding their behaviors and habits and actions that come from their mind, come from their, their repressions. Or I like to think of the metaphor of like, if you sweep, if you sweep things under the rug enough, then sooner or later you're going to trip over it. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of times when we trip over the rug, it's probably at a time that was inconvenient for you, you know? So how I like to think about those things is when you when it comes up, it's just like opportunity. It's an opportunity. That's um, It's an opportunity to face the fear. But that fear is something that is something on the opposite side of it that the fear is holding it hostage, you know. Um, yeah. Blessing on that side. So the, the, all those statistics definitely stood out, um, along with the fact that, well, you just kind of like broke down the, the attachment styles and how different the three or four are. Um, like you said, I heard about them before, um, but I haven't had a conversation about them. And as it relates to myself, as it relates to how I've seen them impact me in my life. And now I know I'm going to have to like, oh, let me like look at, let me look at the past a little more and, you know, like mm-hmm. analyze that day. <laughs> so yeah. it gave me some more work to do for sure too. Well, I'm glad that you could take something away. A hundred percent. I love that. So I preach boundaries, right? So 
this is a time and episode where if you want to give people your socials where they can reach you, maybe continue conversations or learn more about your business or collective, where can they reach you? And if you don't feel like sharing, it's completely up to you too. Absolutely. Um, so let me, I will give you guys my social um, and I will give you the website as well. Um, but you can find me on Instagram at the number four, um, the number four, the collective underscore. And I'm on TikTok and Facebook. I'm also on YouTube as well. Um, the website is the number four, the collective.com. Um, just add, if nothing else, just come check out the information and see how you can use some of this information to transform your lives. Because at the end of the day, we're just a community and network here to help people transform from survival mode to thriving mode. Um, so yeah, thank awesome. you for having me. A shout out. Yeah, of course. Thank you for showing up. And for those of you who are listening still, I would appreciate it if you shared this video, this podcast episode with a friend who maybe didn't know anything about attachment styles. And if you want more information, especially on how attachment styles relate to trauma bonds, watch this video here because it's going to pop up. And I would appreciate it if you shared this with a friend too. All right, y'all. Walk good, keep the vibes high, and I will see y'all in the next episode.